Welcome everyone uh, uh, to our weekly update uh, where we talk about what's been going on in the last week in the markets and what we see coming up and opportunities within the portfolio. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm Michael LeBlanc and Director and Senior Portfolio Manager at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Uh, and I'm your host every week here, every Tuesday at noon. And if you've lost count of time or days, today is April 21st. Uh, and we have a bit to cover today, a little bit of different format, uh, where I'm gonna talk more about individual opportunities and how to identify them, as opposed to focusing just on the general markets. We've seen a lot happen over the last week. And as usual, our disclaimer, uh, we do try to keep the information in these weekly updates as up to date as possible. Obviously the information is changing moment by moment. Um, so if you see a number on there, uh, it's the most recent ones we could pull together uh, in time for this. Uh, but if you do have any questions uh, or you'd like some more information or something that specifically relates to your situation, as always reach out to us. We're happy to give you some one-on-one uh, -on -one time to, uh, to look at your situation and how it can apply to, uh, some of these recommendations can apply to you. Uh, they're general recommendations, they're not for broad use, uh, everyone's situation's different, so keep that in mind, uh, and uh, we'll get going. So before we get started, as always, uh, if you do have any questions, if you move your mouse over the toolbar down at the bottom of your screen there, there's a little box, Q&A, uh, you click on there, and you can type in any questions. I'll try to definitely get to them at the end, if they come through in the middle, uh, I'll try to stay on top of them. Uh, but I am, I am 50, so you know, technology is not my forte. But I'm getting a little bit better at this. But I'll try to stay on top of them throughout the uh, throughout the presentation as well. Uh, as we do every week, I like to highlight, uh, you know, charitable giving and helping out during this time. Uh, some people have been more fortunate than others. Uh, usually, or the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the food banks in, in the the communities uh, and how they're struggling a little bit with all the unemployment and people reaching out to them. Uh, this week, uh, North Shore, I live in North Vancouver, so um, mine, every week I, I like to feature something from uh, North Vancouver, Vancouver. Um, but of course, you might have a very similar uh, program or uh, groups in your own uh, towns, in your own communities. Um, North Shore Family Services here in, in Vancouver uh, help not just with food, but with um, family services, counseling. This is a tough time for a lot of people. Uh, obviously, uh, those who are being affected directly by this virus, um, you know, are isolated from their families. Uh, so I do recommend if you can help to reach out. And keep in mind, as we've talked about in some of our tax sessions. Uh, you can use uh, securities as gifts. You can um, set up your own foundations as part of a, a, an estate plan uh, for given. You can do it over longer periods of time. Any, any amount helps. Any way you can reach out to your communities, I do encourage it. So uh, here we're highlighting the Family Services of North Vancouver. So as uh, we normally follow this format, we're going to talk a little bit about where we're at with COVID. Uh, then we're going to talk about where we're at today, uh, generally uh, out there in the markets, uh, and where we see the opportunities next. So when it comes to COVID, uh, you know, every week we tend to talk about what's been changed, what's going on. Last week we covered a lot about some areas where the curve has been flattening. The, the outlook has been uh, getting better. Obviously this week, a lot of talk about reopening. Uh, especially down in the U.S. And the U.S. is a focus of these weekly updates because the size of their economy does drive what's happening a little bit more, uh, not just here in Canada, but around the world. So, uh, so we do take that into account a lot. Uh, and of course, they're pushing for reopening. Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, the, the rights or the wrongs of the politics in that. Um, simply, uh, you know, I do get asked my view a lot. Uh, just simply... Uh, you know, we, we've made a big sacrifice. The world has made a big sacrifice in closing things down, in self-isolated, uh, uh, in order to flatten the curve, in order to help those that are more at risk uh, and minimize the impact of this virus. Um, I do think, and you know, we've already done that, whether right or wrong, uh, 
you know, opening too soon and, and, and potentially undoing that sacrifice or, or that being for the damage being for, for nothing um, might not necessarily be the, the best decision uh, and maybe a slower approach. Uh, we'll have to see how it rolls out in the U.S. We've already seen some states uh, starting to, uh, start to reopen a little bit. Uh, Florida, uh, which was a late one to close in the first place, uh, and, and a couple other states um, under pressure of protest. Um, we'll have to see how that, that plays. So that's kind of what's been going on uh, this week around the virus itself. Uh, Trump, of course, rolled out his reopening plan. Nothing surprising about the plan. Uh, we did talk about what we would likely expect with the rollout, and it was a phased rollout. And, uh, uh, and there are a few triggers that to the U.S. government put behind this. Uh, you know, for example, the, the states would uh, or communities would have to see a flattening of the curve for two weeks before they started doing their rollouts. Uh, you know, phase one, not surprising. Uh, continued physical distancing, uh, limited uh, public gatherings, so no big, uh, no big festivals, no big parties, uh, concerts, sports, those types of things uh, wouldn't wouldn't be there. And as long as that went smoothly and continued improvement and flattening of the of the numbers, phase two, still encouraging that social distancing, uh, slightly larger gatherings but still not uh, still not a lot of uh, contact with the large groups uh, and some slow return to travel um, and these are the big factors and how long these phases take is, is, is going to be uh, the, the real um, catalyst here for things going back to normal is how long we can get there uh, you know travel is still not discouraged Air Canada announced this morning here in Canada they're cutting off all travel to the U.S. at least until mid-May, subject to um, more restrictions or uh, ease of restrictions from the Canadian government. Uh, and the international travel, of course, is, is pretty uh, very, very limited and essential travel only. So, uh, so whether we see any uh, opening of that in, in the shorter term, um, probably not for, for many months uh, to come. Uh, maybe some easing on the uh, local travel within the countries, uh, or at least a pickup of that uh, as we move through these different phases. The last phase three, of course, return to normalcy. Uh, that may be a long, long time. And what what new normalcy is going to be is, is the 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 big what if. You know, there's there's talk of the the, the handshake being um, being phased out of our our normal interactions, uh, just because people are going to be a little bit more leery. Uh, I know if you go out into public, I've been to uh, about once a week, I, I have to go out to a store uh, and you can really see people being very conscious of being distant and keeping space. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see how long society and people uh, take to, uh, to get back to that normal over time. So not a lot of surprises in any of that. Uh, we kind of knew it was coming and the phase rollout was, uh, was very expected. Just an update on the numbers that we look at every week. Again, we focus on, on the U.S. Uh, so these are from yesterday. Uh, they are, I think, through 44,000 uh, deaths today, this morning. Uh, and I think they're approaching just shy of the, um, uh, the 800,000 mark. I think we're very close to the 800,000 uh, total cases mark. So uh, while they did see a couple of days of slowdown after a big surge late last week, they had a very large surge. Uh, it did slow down for a couple of days, uh, but we have seen an, another surge again today. So yes, the numbers are flattening a little bit, but certainly certainly not gone away and we're seeing some flare ups and some hot spots. So, uh, so the US still remains a bit of a concern and obviously uh, very, very looking very closely at this phase rollout uh, in hopes of not seeing a second wave of infections. Uh, the rest of the world uh, continued uh, continued infections, continued uh, impacts, but it is flattening a lot more. We are starting to see uh, you know, China reopening, uh, the restaurants reopening. We talked about the, the quality of their numbers there, but that being the quality of their numbers aside, the reopenings are starting to happen. Uh, we're even seeing a little bit of ease in, in, in places like Italy. Uh, so, uh, so as we see other countries start to reopen, we'll, we'll get a better idea of, uh, of what the picture is going to look like. Canada is still faring very, fairly well. Uh, we are still seeing increasing numbers, 
uh, but the hospitals are staying on top of it. Uh, we have not been overwhelmed yet. Uh, obviously, it hit a little harder back in hit back east in Quebec, especially, but uh, still managing. Um, and our thanks, of course, goes out to everybody on the front line who's helping doing that. So where are we today? Uh, just some recaps from last week. Uh, we did see after so, some run-ups in the markets, we did see the market start to pull back uh, a little bit late last week. And of course, this week, uh, today being a, yesterday in the US being a negative day, uh, Canada fairly flat. Um, the uh, today being negative in both markets uh, as of just uh, beginning of this, this live taping. Uh, and a, the big, big part started last week, but uh, the, the oil prices. Uh, you'll see in the news, negative oil prices. So this has never happened in history. This is the, uh, the lowest. You can't get much lower than negative uh, oil prices. <clears throat> and that's basically uh, just a massive drop in uh, demand for oil with the, the travel being shut down. Uh, of course, cars, which is a small part of it, industrial shutdowns. Um, it's into negative prices basically because it doesn't matter how much we're pumping out of the ground or not pumping out of the ground these days. Um, there's just nowhere to put it. All the reserves are full. Uh, I actually saw a piece late last night I was going to try to include into the presentation. Um, maybe I'll get it for next week, but it, it was basically uh, how much you could get paid if you filled up your pool, or your hot tub with oil right now, just to store it uh, for the, uh, for the producers. There's just nowhere to put it. And that's where we've seen those, those, those negative numbers. And we'll touch a little bit what that impact uh, will have in, in uh, shortly here. Uh, we did see some uh, some treasuries to the U.S. currency rise a little bit. The Canadian dollar is holding in. Uh, we saw the gold lift a little bit, uh, not not very much given what's going on. Um, uh, much like we saw in 08, 09, uh, gold just hasn't reacted as the hedge that uh, we would expect it to, or we would have expected it to in, in, in decades gone by. Um, it's the U.S. dollar that seems to be the, um, the flight to quality uh, that we see around the world in, in these, uh, these hard times. So uh, we continue to see that, although a little bit of lifting gold. Um, and it certainly has not performed badly over the last couple of months, um, but it has not had the, the lift that one would, one would expect. Uh, in the U.S., we're, we're entering into earnings week uh, or earnings season. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of companies uh, announce their quarterly earnings. We are expecting them to be uh, negative. Uh, obviously, the impacts of the shutdown is going to impact uh, almost, almost all companies. And, and, and we'll, we'll kind of touch on what those numbers mean. Uh, Procter Gamble uh, is scheduled to report. Uh, it's third quarter. Of course, Procter & Gamble is a well-diversified conglomerate. They make everything, paper products, the soaps, the toothpaste. Uh, so they should do well, although we do expect some negativity in their supply chain to slow down some sales. That doesn't mean bad. The demand's higher. They just can't deliver as much that the, the, the demand is there. And some of the product, of course, uh, would be coming out of China where uh, manufacturing and factories were shut down. Uh, for uh, for many weeks, and that's going to affect their ability to to deliver those. And we're also seeing on the paper side the pulp mill shutting down, uh, and that's the main raw material going into paper products. So probably some supply chain issues there. But overall, we expect Procter and Gamble to be healthy healthy reporter reporting coming up, um, and and uh, Schlumberger's is going going to be announcing this week as well. Another major one, uh, Citibank, I believe, is reporting this week, uh, United Airlines. Um, we're going to see a lot, and, and the numbers are going to be very telling. And I think that's why we're seeing the, the, the negativity in the market this week, is things are going to be worse than I think the market had expected. Uh, and remember, that's only March's impact. February, for the most part, things were open, and this, uh, these earnings are from January to the end of March. So it's going to give us an insight into what we can expect to see for the next quarter where most things were, were fairly low. Uh, top news in the US, um, of course, as I mentioned, oil uh, completely gone into the negatives. Even the long -term longer term futures uh, contracts uh, are around $9 today. Um, so we'll keep it very close on that. United Airlines, they're already reporting a $2 billion loss. They're expected to see a $2 billion loss. Um, and they've, they've dipped into government um, 
government aid for about 4.5 billion. Uh, we'll have to see there. The airlines are going to be very interesting ones to watch. I'm getting a lot of questions about the airlines uh, through all this, whether they're a, a good purchase or not. Uh, just keep in mind that after 9-11 in 2001, uh, it took nine years for the airlines to get back to the same pre-crisis pricing. So uh, I do not expect them to bounce back very quickly. They are very at risk industry, not just because of the crisis, but because they, most of them do not own very many hard assets. It's mostly leased planes. Uh, they operate mostly on cash flow. And uh, for the most part, cash flows have gone to zero. So uh, yes, they may be a good buy. Uh, however, it could be a long road ahead. Um, well, it, it's going to be how quickly the phases roll out as to the reopening goes and also how quickly people start to book up, book up travel again uh, as people may shift their, their habits and behaviors uh, as we go through this. I did mention to you, uh, a few people over the last week that uh, have been looking to pick uh, one of the airlines as a potential um, investment. Uh, you know, right now when you talk airlines specifically, it's a bit of a dartboard as to which one's going to fare well, fare better through all this. And that's mainly because we don't have a ton of data. Um, there is an ETF and we're going to talk a little bit more about ETFs uh, out there. It's called JETS, J-E-T-S, -E uh, on the U.S. exchange and U.S. dollars. And it's basically the, the U.S. large airlines. So um, if you did want to take a, a risky bet on those, maybe play something a little bit more diversified where you don't have to get lucky and pick the one that, uh, that doesn't uh, get hit the hardest. So... Um, so that might be a, a way to look at that. Halliburton uh, books a uh, one billion dollar charge down. They slash spending by fifty percent. This is a common theme we're going we're going to see for the uh, for the next couple of weeks here with as earnings come out. Uh, energy companies, of course, being very very hard hit. Dupont actually saw some uh, some increase in uh, in quarterly profits, and that's mainly mainly due to their uh, products that are used in the personal protection and water filtration systems. So, uh, so it's not all bad news out there. Some companies are doing well uh, and are able to weather the storm. So we'll keep that in mind. Um, Burger chain, uh, Shake Shack. So if you're not aware, one of the programs the U.S. put out uh, was um, a $350 billion fund to help small businesses. And we saw a bit of controversy and not surprising um, so Shake Shack, which is a burger chain in the U.S., uh, applied for, uh, for help under that program and got a $10 million government loan. Uh, and that, that $350 billion was specifically supposed to be for small businesses. Um, and the controversy was around whether uh, a chain, a franchise chain like uh, Shake Shack, which um, per location would qualify under the small business, but as a whole company, it is larger and shouldn't necessarily qualify. Uh, that's not surprising to see there's a confusion. Whenever a government or whenever any program is rolled out as fast and as quickly as they had to do these programs, uh, some un miscommunications, lack of clarity, uh, and, and exactly how to apply it is, is going to happen for sure. We've seen the same in Canada uh, with the $2,000 a month um, for individuals. Uh, where it's been double paid a couple of times and, and there's been a lot of instructions for people on how to repay the extra payments. Um, and we've also seen changes to, uh, to who qualifies, uh, where they didn't include uh, university students or seasonal workers uh, originally, and now they, they have. So it's an evolving uh, program. It's an evolving system as we deal with, um, as we see how it actually impacts. So uh, the good news on that, Shake Shack did return the 10 million uh, under that program to allow it to go to smaller businesses. And we'll probably see that trend continue. In Canada, uh, home prices actually climbed in March. Um, and, uh, and this is across Canada numbers. Uh, the, the data, one thing to keep in mind with that though, the data, again, a lot of these were, were, were sales that were, were booked or, or, or negotiated prior to the, the, the close down. That doesn't mean uh, there is some estimates that we could see a drop of 40% in the short term in real estate. Uh, and that's just due to the complete lack of activity that we're seeing. 
Um, you know, there is still showings. There are on our online showings uh, as far as real estate goes, but it, obviously it has slowed down dramatically um, with all the uncertainty that's going on. But uh, March numbers weren't that bad. Uh, in the oils, Husky, uh, Crescent Point slashed their budgets uh, here in Canada as well. And we'll talk more about that theme. Canada Life had to raise some premiums. Uh, so if you're applying for, for new critical illness or life insurance, uh, they've upped their premiums by about 27% for new applicants. Uh, and that's to offset um, the recent interest rate cuts because, of course, the insurance companies have a lot of um, cash that they, uh, they have to keep uh, to meet demand for, for claims. And uh, the interest rates have dropped so low that uh, they're seeing a little bit of hit on their earnings from that front. So. They, they are, we're seeing another effect of all this uh, affect the premiums on interest or, or sorry, on insurance rates. Uh, Shopify, which is one of the companies that's doing well out there, online retailer, um, are, you know, helping out their, their clientele, the small businesses that supply them with product. Uh, so we are seeing some good news out there. We're seeing some companies that are, are thriving, reaching out to help those that are being hit more from this global economic shutdown. Uh, Flight, uh, flight trainer, CAE, um, you obviously uh, laid off a lot of employees, as in we're not flying. There's no new flight trainers or, or anyone buying simulators right now, uh, but they've recalled uh, 1,500 employees. We also Air Canada do that, and that's through the government uh, program that's paying 75% of their, of their uh, wages as long as the, uh, the companies keep them employed. So some good news coming through the government programs um, and, uh, and earnings season come out up here. Uh, but do these numbers are going to be the first numbers we're really going to get insight into what's, how companies are actually being affected and what sectors are being affected the most. So where does that put us today? So uh, really what we're looking at in this earnings is how cash flows are being affected in the companies. And, and one of the things we're seeing is dividend cuts. So these are companies that pay dividends or have traditionally paid dividends and are cutting them completely or partially. Uh, normally when we go into a recession, we would see about 25 uh, or so uh, on average uh, cuts per month during the recession. Uh, we've already seen that in April. We're, we're bar you know, barely halfway through uh, or at the time of this, uh, we were barely halfway through. Uh, and that trend is consider considerably um, increasing. Uh, even in the month of April here, uh, both in Canada and the U.S. These are the U.S. numbers. Uh, and in different sectors are being affected differently. Uh, oil and gas, of course, makes a lot of sense uh, that they'd be cutting dividend and saving cash. Now, the cut itself doesn't mean bad investment. It, it could be a very healthy move for a company just to shore up cash in the temporary term to get them through so they don't have to take loans so they don't have to draw down on credit. So it could very well be a healthy move for a company. So don't, uh, don't let that um, turn you off of a company, but certainly seeing why the cut is happening uh, and how their cash flows are being affected. The REITs, the, for the next two there, the finance REITs, those are the mortgage REITs and, and finance, the, the, the services, are, uh, that's also a REIT in, in the services area. Um, they're the ones that uh, mortgage uh, real estate um, those, again, we've talked the last few weeks. I'd be very cautious in the REIT sector right now. Uh, we are seeing cuts. We are seeing cash flows dropped. I've seen some numbers uh, in the, the REIT arena of um, 60 to 70% of uh, ability to collect on, on rents, um, which means they're not getting 30 to 40% of the regular income. Uh, so that's going to be hard to recover. And of course, if the real estate market uh, continues to, um, or, or does slump for a period of time, it's going to affect the REITs uh, as their, their borrowing to asset level uh, would increase. Uh, and also, as we see more and more closures of companies uh, or individuals, whether it be uh, commercial real estate or uh, personal real estate, uh, you know, we're going to see those numbers accelerate. More and more defaults happening. Uh, we're seeing chains um, completely shut down. We're seeing um, stores close uh, locations, um, you know, businesses reducing staff, reducing real estate. 
Uh, so I'd be very cautious in the REIT and this trend, you know, we're seeing it early in these areas. So they're going to be the higher risk ones. Uh, materials, a, a little bit media, again, not surprising as um, traditional media like newspapers close down uh, as people aren't buying them, aren't, aren't, aren't collecting them, you know, don't want that contact with the paper. Uh, financial banks, mostly they, uh, these are the alternative lenders. The big banks um, have not cut anything yet. And uh, as we mentioned previously, uh, the Canadian banks did not cut through the 0809 crisis and afterwards they actually increased. So uh, we still like that sector. Manufacturing, mining and services uh, a little bit. Uh, and, and those might have just been cuts that uh, were, were coming anyway. Uh, this, this just accelerated things. So just some names uh, from the U.S. That, that we've seen already starting to cut. Um, again, not any surprises, mostly in the REITs and the energy sectors. Uh, where we've seen them hardest hit. Canada, we've seen actually a higher number. And again, a lot in the um, uh, energy sector, oil companies, uh, but also a lot on the restaurant side. You know, we've got Pizza Pizza, uh, Boston Pizza in there, uh, A&W, uh, and some real, and, and again, the REITs, the real estate uh, are being affected quite a bit. So a lot of cuts. In fact, Canada's got a couple pages of cuts. Uh, we'll, we'll be watching those a lot more. It's going to tell us which companies are healthier, uh, which companies are able to weather the storm by cutting. Um, but another effect that we really need to keep in mind, um, and I'm going to jump ahead to this one, uh, is companies drawn down on lines of credits. Uh, so a lot of companies always keep a line of credit open, just as individuals uh, usually do. And that's to, uh, you know, an emergency, uh, a sudden need of cash, we, you know, whether it's a positive cash, a need for growth, uh, negative cash need uh, for dealing with a crisis. Um, but just looking at the U.S. specifically, going into this crisis, there's about 2.5 trillion in, in credit commitments out there that were not drawn upon. So, you know, line of credits that people just, uh, or companies had not used. Uh, and since this has happened, 64% of that at last uh, calculation that I uh, was able to get the numbers on have been drawn down. So that means they've drawn those line of credits, they, credits, they put that cash into the bank to help them get them through a crisis. No, that's good that the companies have cash to deal with things, uh, but it's not necessarily great because now they're carrying that debt. And when this is all over, they, they, they have to start repaying that debt. Uh, Air Canada here, as an example, uh, I think the last report I heard that they pulled down, you know, they said they had $18 billion in cash, but they pulled most of that out of their lines of credit. So, uh, so on one side, that's good that they have cash to uh, weather some storm, but, uh, but that has an expiry date when that's going to run out as they burn through it. And of course, they're, they're adding those payments, interest payments uh, and debt payments uh, to their balance sheets going forward. So uh, that's the other thing to really keep in mind when we're looking at companies is to uh, how much they've had to pull down on the line or credits through this uh, versus cutting a dividend and just banking the cash they would know where to pay out for a dividend. So weigh those two things when you're looking at the companies. Um, and as I mentioned, REITs, we are starting to separate REITs, uh, especially in the U.S., from mortgage, uh, separating them in, in different classes, uh, like, such as mortgage REITs. So REITs who carry debt against um, real estate, mostly commercial and hotel rates, because the hotel rates are going to be uh, affected very much differently um, and maybe a lot longer for them to recover. One thing that we've been advising people, again, who are looking for, for deep uh, discounted buys, whether it be hotels or airlines, uh, is be very cautious. Um, some reasons, there's a, sometimes there's a reason they're that discounted. Uh, and really look at return to uh, return to cash flow uh, scenarios. Uh, you know, hotels being a great example. Uh, I mean, we could come out of uh, this this quarantine tomorrow, um, and a lot of the hotel's income comes from uh, business spending. So the the conventions or the conferences, and uh, those generally take corporations uh, anywhere from six months to a year to plan. Uh, they're not things that are put together in a month. And they've all been suspended for the most part for this year, or at least into the late uh, fourth quarter of this year. Um, they've all been canceled or suspended. So uh, the hotels really won't see a lot of that returning uh, into late this year, possibly into next year, 
uh, as companies just forego um, their, their conventions and conferences for uh, for 2020. So uh, they will have a bit of harder time to return back to the same type of revenue numbers that they were experiencing going into this. And not to mention the pleasure travel. Most people have canceled the vacations for 2020. Um, again, even if we come out of this here in the early summer, um, how quickly are people going to return to that? And if they do, do they just book into next year um, and, and just forego this year's um, in, in light of what, uh, in what we've experienced? So we really watch uh, which areas are going to return to uh, normal cash flows and, and how quickly. So when we're looking at companies and where the opportunities might be, we really have to you know, take all that into consideration and say what companies have minor impacts and which ones are more severely affected. So you know, what we've seen so far in the minor impact, utility companies, of course, we're still using our utilities, power. Even uh, if you look at companies like Telus or Bell, um, yes, their earnings are gonna be hurt, but most of that is the, the, the ability to deliver the service. Demand has actually increased. Uh, they just haven't been able to keep up with all the demand from uh, person, whether it be supply chain shortages or personnel shortages. Um, but, but that's not necessarily a bad sign. That just means um, when things do return to normal, the demand has actually increased through this. So uh, there's, there's good potential for, uh, for them to bounce back, not just quickly, but maybe to new highs um, after this. So uh, keep, keep those in mind. Groceries, of course, we've seen continue, in fact, increase uh, through this as we don't have the restaurants. Uh, they're our main source for, for food and we're cooking more. Again, we're probably going to see a lot of behavior change through all this and whether that continues as well. Internet services, people have been increasing uh, the different services that they have or speeds that they use or capacities uh, just to keep up with this. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, positive news coming out of there. Technology, uh, we're going to dive more into technology, but of course it's benefiting from this as we all, as we're doing right now, rely on technology to uh, communicate, to socialize, uh, but also uh, we're, we're going to see so a lot of areas embrace technology because they're being forced to right now, but continue that trend and, and, and blend that into their day-to-day -day business. Some financials are doing, uh, doing better. We're seeing uh, increase and of course internet stocks. Uh, any company that uh, had embraced the internet, uh, whether it be retail sales, <clears throat> services, or or a supplier, uh, in, as far as internet goes, uh, are seeing benefits as as company and people are relying on that uh, more and more. The uh, severity of impacts uh, that we look at that, that are going to be hit harder um, could be more temporary, but what we're seeing is industrials. Of course, the shutdowns are, are taking their revenues down to zero. Uh, energy, uh, the time of right in this, I had said some energy. Uh, as of today, I'd say almost all energy, of course, would be massively impacted. Auto sales, of course, people aren't driving, people aren't purchasing. Uh, I know of, uh, just scanning the ads, uh, you, you see all kinds of sales in the, uh, in the autos right now. Uh, I wouldn't even know how you'd go shopping for one right now, but uh, so they're, uh, potentially uh, uh, an area for bounce back when this is all over. People might jump on uh, buying cars or upgrading their cars after we come out of this. Supply chain, I think, is something that will come back quickly as, as things start to open again. Uh, the supply chain uh, will start to revamp or, or reinitialize very quickly, uh, as the, whether it be shelves or uh, supplies or, or materials have to, be, uh, have to be brought in at a very fast pace. And home builders, we've recently seen those numbers start to slide. For the most part, uh, they weren't affected as they continued. Uh, but now where they're seeing is that supply chain interruption. The, 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 the wood mills are, are, are shutting down. The steel mills, the, the, the parts that they need to, uh, to move ahead are starting to dry up. Uh, so that's that we're seeing that start to be impacted, um, but maybe a temporary industry. Uh, businesses that are going to be permanently or at least longer term impacted, as we mentioned, the airline travel and leisure, of course, restaurants, some of them for sure are, are not going to be weathered, weathering the storm. And again, going back to helping out, um, I know, uh, personally know some restaurant owners that uh, are doing their best 
uh, but they are struggling. If you can help, um, you know, reach out to them, you know, buy, uh, whether it be even buy a gift card for the future or, uh, you know, they do, a lot of them are doing curbside pickup or takeout. Um, but the, the smaller chains, the smaller uh, independent owners are, are, are suffering right now. So there is going to be a big impact on, on that area, probably permanent. We've, we've already seen a lot of closures uh, where they've announced they're just not going to reopen. Um, so uh, that's going to be a long-term impact for sure. And we're going to see a lot more in this category as earnings seasons come out. Uh, so kind of uh, found this chart uh, very interesting as kind of potential losers. Now remember these are potential. Uh, we're seeing more as news and things evolve. We see them more and of course, you know, on the red, on the loser side, you know, tourism, aviation, we've talked all about construction. Uh, and then kind of on the winter, you see the oil and gas is kind of in between. So oil is definitely uh, losing right now. Um, but when, when things and how long that's going to take is going to be the big challenge, return back to normal. Uh, no matter what we do, we're not going to Im immediately wipe out our dependency on oil. The demand on it may decrease uh, as we come out of this, uh, but it's not going to wipe out completely. So these negative numbers cannot last. Uh, of course, the reserves will get used up and, and uh, it may be a winner uh, down the road. Agriculture's people shot more, although there again, they're on the cusp of the line uh, as we're seeing a lot of... Uh, a lot of food being uh, just dumped right now. Um, it, it's incredible. We've seen, uh, you, you know, everything from potatoes to, to different crops, uh, dairy being dumped, even beer uh, with all the restaurants, uh, the, the draft beer, which uh, can't be bottled, it's, it's brewed differently, um, is, is being dumped as the, the restaurant closures, of course, uh, are their, their main distribution channels. So, uh, we're seeing a lot of that, but the agriculture, uh, as we maybe shift behaviors going forward, uh, continue to do well. Of course, e-commerce is one that's, uh, that, that is doing well, and we do expect it to continue. Um, we've got communication, uh, uh, internet communication, um, the taluses I've mentioned in the world, the bells, uh, personal care, the, the, the soaps, uh, it'll be, you know, again, another potential behavior change. Uh, are we going to continue the um, the washing of the hands, being extra, extra cautious, uh, more careful as we move, so, move forward? But we've certainly seen those industries benefit in, uh, through all this. Uh, food processing and retail, of course, we've seen uh, people stay at home more and medical supplies and services uh, where the demand is, is massively increasing. Uh, and and thing to really watch, and I mentioned earlier the technology, and I really want to dive into this a little bit, is uh, we're going to come out of this different. The world's going, going to be different in a lot of different ways. And one of the big ones, I think, is going to be our use of technology. We've already, technology has already been a massive disruptor in different industries. And I think one of the, the easiest examples is I can, can bring out is, is something like Uber or Lyft uh, for the transportation industry where they brought in a technology, you know, revolutionized things, um, kind of took control uh, and became, came out, you know, at the top of the pack as, as certainly as far as popularity and, and people's usage goes. Um, and a lot of industries like the taxi companies resisted technology for many, many years uh, because they didn't feel that they had to make changes. What we're seeing now is, is every industry right now is embracing technology because they're, they're being forced to. So that means, how is that going to evolve? How are they going to change, be more efficient, uh, deliver in a different way, um, their services going forward? And uh, we'll likely see a lot of disruptions, uh, a lot of different industries uh, evolve and come out of this stronger uh, by embracing technology. So that technology sector is, is one we're definitely focusing on through this. And I had a conversation with uh, a couple of people this week about, um, you know, that the, some of the technology companies uh, stocks haven't been hit as hard or, you know, have maintained fairly well uh, their valuations. And, uh, you know, they didn't think that they were as deep of a discount or, or as cheap of a buy. Um, sometimes that's those cheap buys are called what we call value traps uh, where it looks like a great value, but there's a reason why it's that low. Whereas other ones that hold in quite well uh, means that they're not only going to hold well, but likely go up even higher when things return to normal as their technology 
start to be more broadly used as people see the benefit of it. So um, in the coming weeks, you're going to see, you will see me talking a lot more about the technologies uh, that we're, that are evolving right now. Zoom, the technology we're using today, of course, is one of those benefactors. Um, and, and, and we're going to, we'll see more and more of that uh, as things uh, roll through our, this quarantine. Just as an example is um, key site technologies. Uh, you know, they've announced recently they've closed their locations, uh, at least until the, uh, they did until the end of March. Uh, you know, their stock dropped by about 30%. Um, but we see this as an opportunity. A key site is a key manufacturer of 5G technology um, that is the next, the next wave in our, in our phones, in our internet providers. Uh, and you know, China has been invested ma massively into this. And if you haven't followed um, the, the Huawei controversy with the US, uh, a lot of this has been around uh, who's, going to, who's going to control the 5G technology, certainly in North America. And partially in Europe, there's been another, uh, you know, China and Europe have been uh, at uh, the butt and heads on, on who's going to get a foothold in that. Um, and, uh, and the U.S. has been adamant that they are going to control it in, in North America. So uh, Keysight is well, well positioned to see a surge of uh, expansion through this uh, as the need for higher speeds, as the need for more bandwidth uh, grows. Um, it, it, it's a good company to, to look at and certainly one we're looking into for the portfolios. I remind everybody, if you haven't been listening, uh, we have been waiting for another pullback in the market before uh, we start buying uh, with the cash that we have on hand. Uh, we still have a lot of cash on hand uh, and we're starting to see that pullback now. So ones we're looking at very closely. Microsoft, again, their news came out saying, you know, they weren't, they're, they're changing their guidance for their earnings saying, we're not going to be able to meet our, our, our equipment uh, demands on the Surface and Windows products, um, but that but that just is telling us that they've had such an increase in demand, they can't keep up. Um, so you know the shares fell by about thirty percent. We see that as a, a great buying opportunity, uh, where they're going going to uh, come out of this with uh, higher revenues than they went in with. ASML, uh, same idea as Keysight. Um, you know, they came out that they're going to be impacted. Uh, but really what we're seeing is uh, a massive demand for their uh, the EUV uh, systems. Uh, and this is ultraviolet light uh, systems that in semiconductor. Uh, so faster chips, fi faster technology. This is a next generation um, that the demand is spiking uh, because uh, as, as new demand comes in, the companies are looking at bringing out the next generation as opposed to just repackaging old. Uh, and if those are too high tech for us, look at Nike came out, said they're closing a bunch of stores. And we talked about that on the REITs, definitely gonna impact the REIT side of things. Uh, but demand has never been higher and Nike is one of those companies that embrace the online um, econ market. Uh, and not only did we see in December sales, Christmas sales, uh, spike for companies like this, uh, we're, we're seeing it continue to spike. So they're just not being able to keep up with demand. In fact, their demands are uh, at, at above holiday peak season, uh, especially for, for leisure wear right now. You can't even get inventory for from a lot of them right now. But when those supply chains come back up, all those orders and demands uh, will continue. Um, we do see uh, the, the trends that people are going to work more from home and this could continue on for a longer period of time. Um, so, uh, we see these as, you know, as, as great buying opportunities for, for smart companies that have, uh, positioned themselves to, to not only weather the storm, but improve as they move through. Now, not all portfolios in all sectors necessarily want to buy individual positions. I mentioned the airlines. Now, again, I'll qualify the airlines. I do think that's definitely a very speculative trade to, to dive into something like that. And it could be a very long trade until you see your rewards. Uh, but some of the better uh, options out there uh, are ETFs. So if you're not familiar, exchange traded funds are, uh, most people are familiar with mutual funds. Exchange traded funds were an evolution of those. Uh, where mutual funds are open-ended, that means money flows in and out every day as people deposit or withdraw, whereas exchange-traded funds are traded on the stock exchanges, whether it's Canada, the U.S., or around the world, uh, and no money flows in and out. There's money in there, and they buy 
the, the securities, they, they, they have the portfolio, and you just trade with uh, other, uh, other buyers or sellers of those units. Uh, and they come in all areas. So, you know, you can diversify between equities, commodities. Uh, you can have a multi-asset, so a diversified portfolio. You can have fixed income in there. Uh, and, and strategies can be core, so you know, um, kind of that blue chip, safer type of um, investment. They can be sustainable. Uh, you know, if you want to uh, look at sustainable energies, uh, if you want to look at green uh, energies, there's a lot around those. You can be sector specific. You know, you can buy oil, you can buy airlines, you can buy banks. Um, you can buy them that are designed for equity and income, so they they throw off high dividends. Uh, you can buy them currency hedged, so if you want exposure to global markets or U.S. markets, but you want them hedged back to the Canadian currency, you can do that. Smart beta is just a strategy to reduce your uh, your volatility, um, minimal volatility um, strategies where they just buy companies that own that that have historically shown minimal volatility, and of course strategic income, uh, different strategies that will target different types of income. A region, of course, you can diversify anywhere around the world. Uh, markets, whether it's developed markets like Canada or emerging markets like uh, Brazil. Uh, and then style is important right now, passive versus active. Um, you can use them both. Uh, so passive is the portfolio that you're buying. So let's say it's just the five top Canadian banks. Um, it, that's all they're going to own. The, 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 the ETF will not trade those. It will just continuously own the five big Canadian banks. It'll rebalance their weight-ins, but it won't uh, buy or sell anything. That's just what they own. Uh, you can buy the TSX. You can buy uh, the TSX 60, for example, the 60 largest companies in Canada. Um, and it will just own those, those 60 companies. It won't, it won't trade. Active is where you have a portfolio managers actively making trading decisions within the portfolio. Uh, so if you know if you're buying, uh, say, the gold ETF, uh, it will trade the different gold uh, producers uh, in order to try to get you your best return within that sector. So it's going to try to buy the best of the best, get rid of the ones that uh, they don't think is is are going well right now, and buying the ones that they think have higher growth potential. Uh, it's not a bad way to approach parts of your portfolio. I don't highly recommend passive as a, a strategy within the portfolio, meaning just buying some passives and leaving it. Um, if you just want to buy and leave uh, an ETF, uh, I would go with the actives. They are, the fees inside there are slightly more expensive, nowhere near what a mutual fund is, uh, but slightly more expensive. Um, but I would definitely go active. Uh, passive is if you are going to, or work with a, a portfolio manager, to uh, move them around as, as you see uh, the exposures benefiting you. So if you want it to be the Canadian banks, you buy that, but as soon as you decide that the Canadian banks aren't a good exposure and you want to say go into oils, move some or all from the banks over into oils, but be active with the passives. Um, in this type of market, a pure passive strategy is probably not gonna serve you the best. Uh, uh, some sort of active strategy will be, uh, will be your benefit. Um, if you do need some help or you want some more uh, ideas around ETFs, we use them actively in our portfolios. In fact, we have some of our portfolios are pure ETFs uh, and it makes a lot of sense depending on the size of the portfolio uh, because it gives, you diversif it gives us better diversification without having as much capital. Uh, but if you want a little bit more advice, do contact us. We do have systems uh, that we use in our own portfolios. For example, if we said we wanted to buy Nike, uh, I can plug Nike in and it will tell me all the ETFs rated by um, how much they uh, how much they own of Nike uh, and how much their, their underlying fee. Of course, we always want to pick the one with the lowest fees and most of them are um, a percentage of a percentage, you know, like a half of 1% these days. They're very, very cheap to own. Um, but we can pick the ones that have the exposures that you're specifically looking for. Uh, or the exposures that we recommend. So we can just quickly go in and say, if you want exposure to technology, this is the one to buy. Or if you want exposure to Nike, this is the one to buy. If you want tell us, this is the one to buy. So do reach out to us. Um, we'll happily um, have a chat with you, talk about your strategy. Uh, or if you have questions about some of the ones you own and you wanna know what's in them, of course, uh, we're, we're always happy to walk you through those as well. 
So, um, so keep those in mind. They're a great portfolio strategy uh, to incorporate. Uh, even if you're doing individual positions, if you want exposure to foreign countries, uh, you have that currency hedge ability or diversification into a foreign uh, market where trading on it may be very difficult. Uh, or if you want just a broad slice of a certain sector. Uh, so that's it for uh, this week. Um, as always, uh, Q&A. And uh, I'll just bring them up here. Um, there's only a couple this week. It's good. Uh, so just a question on the uh, ETFs is, uh, do we recommend using them in, in, in an active portfolio? Yes, absolutely, as, as we kind of talked about. Um, really worthwhile to incorporate them. They're very powerful tools and uh, you don't give up much in the return. Not if you use them, the very specific ones. Again, the broad ones are a little bit more difficult to really um, get alpha or get a stronger, better than market performance out of it because they're pretty much just gonna match the market. Uh, but the very uh, specific or sector specific ones um, will give you that extra value. And that's mainly what we use uh, in order to overweight or underweight different portfolios. Uh, another question, just more around, sorry, the question is, um, what types of technology um, would you recommend for exposures? Uh, well, 5G is a very favorite one of mine, uh, but don't discount the utilities or kind of the service ones. As we mentioned, Microsoft, I mentioned Telus, uh, which I'd actually throw, I know it's a, it's a telecommunication uh, company, or utility, but really their, their center focus is around uh, use of technology. Don't discount those. If you want a broader play, again, you can just buy the NASDAQ. The, the NASDAQ mar market is mostly uh, technology companies. Uh, and if we've mentioned in previous uh, weekly updates, uh, Visa and MasterCard are also, uh, believe it or not, considered technology companies because they don't own any debt. So they're not a financial institution. They just bring you that piece of plastic technology that you can uh, tap everywhere you want. And, uh, and now you can even program into your phones and tap wherever you want. So they're, they're also both great, great buys on the technology front. So that's it for questions this week. As always, uh, by all means, reach out to us with your personal questions. This will be available for playback. Feel free to uh, share and forward. Uh, and if you want the links, uh, reach out to us. Otherwise, We'll talk to you next week with our next week's update and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you all. Take care.